You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. It was murder. Plain and simple. At least that was clear to George Washington, now the President of the United States, and no stranger to violence, no stranger to the use of firearms, swords, other weapons... Hey, it's Otis Gray. Do you have trouble falling asleep? Well, you should check out this podcast called Sleepy. It's where I read old classics and help you fall asleep. Best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. And that's it. So get tucked in, fluff up the cool side of your pillow, and take a one-way train down to Sleepy Town. Unless you're driving, then please don't listen to Sleepy. New episodes go out every Sunday, so you can get refreshed for your week. Subscribe to Sleepy wherever you get your podcasts. Sweet dreams. As the nation's first president, he had to deal with, among the most pressing problems, issues with Native American nations. When he was only citizen Washington in 1785, the Confederation U.S. government, without his involvement, created the Treaty of Hopewell with the Cherokee Indians, specifying a large area of parts of today's Tennessee, South Carolina, and Georgia as hunting grounds. The treaty specified in Article 5 that the Cherokees were in charge of these grounds. Non-Cherokee U.S. citizens would have no U.S. protection. The Cherokees could regulate them, kick them out. This didn't stop settlement, however, in these hunting grounds. Skirmishes, of course, between Cherokees and settlers from the treaty signing to the time that Washington was sworn as president continued. Article 7 of this treaty called for the U.S. to punish Americans who murdered Cherokees. But the United States government took no action. As president, George Washington wanted to adjust and define a workable treaty and stop the bloodshed. A meeting was arranged where settlers and Cherokees could discuss their differences. A Captain John Beard raised a militia and raided the meeting, killing Cherokees. Washington was outraged. It was cruel, unprovoked murder. And he did not both sides the issue or parse the blame. It was unprincipled wretches. Now, as president, he sought to enforce the unenforced, previously unenforced Article 7 and have John Beard arrested. Notwithstanding that Beard had fought in the American Revolution in South Carolina, taken on the British, fought with honor. Beard escaped capture. The federal government's reach wasn't what it was in the 1790s, what it is now, especially with local authorities not cooperating or believing in the arrest. In his following complaint to the South Carolina governor, Washington, the country's chief executive, used a weapon perhaps stronger than the sword that he used to carry. Words. In vain we may expect peace with the Indians on our frontiers, so long as a lawless set of unprincipled wretches can violate the rights of hospitality, he wrote, or infringe on the most solemn treaties. Simply put, Washington was mad, and what he described was a crime, a wrong, a terrible wrong, a violation. He used that word and he used the term infringe to describe the effect his actions would have on what he called solemn treaties. The most formal, dignified, publicly laid out, clear law, solemn laws, oath, agreements characterized by deep sincerity. When broken, they were infringed upon. Why, 30 years before, his older contemporary and respected American, Benjamin Franklin, was trying to get the Quakers in the Pennsylvania colony to accept just a volunteer militia to protect that colony and to help enforce its laws from armed bands in the areas outside the city. Quaker elders, mostly, stood in the way. Franklin made his case clear in his own paper, the Pennsylvania Gazette. He assured them 
They were worried, perhaps, that they would be forced into military service. No, the colony had a strong charter that could not deprive them of freedom of conscience if they didn't want to take arms. They could not be forced. God, he said, is the only father of lights and spirits and the author of divine knowledge. No persons inhabiting this territory shall be in case, in any case, molested or prejudiced in his or her persons or state, nor compelled to do any act or thing contrary to their religious persuasion. It was not an easy sell. And to develop his case, Franklin wrote a dialogue between three fictional characters, X, Y, and Z, and one would ask questions, all the kind of questions that opponents would ask, and the others would explain. In the course of these dialogues, he said, No part of these liberties expressed in this charter can be infringed or broken. Infringed or broken. Moreover, he said in this dialogue, He, the governor, shall take special care that in this respect, in other words, this militia proposal, which was a big issue, London was aware of it, the Pennsylvania authorities were aware of it, it's something they wanted for protection of the colony so it didn't disappear, but there was big opposition to it. He shall take special care that the charter be not infringed in this respect. Two things of note. Franklin, like Washington, equates the word infringe with high holy law. The charter of a colony was everything. It is the equivalent of our United States Constitution today. That's what Pennsylvania was run on. If you're breaking it, and he uses that term exactly, or broken, infringed or broken, suggesting it's synonymous, you're breaking something essential. Hamilton, a letter to Washington, and that the power of the president to call Congress didn't represent usurpation by that office. The power of the president to call Congress, nothing's wrong with it. Are we ready to say that to call upon us to deliberate is an attempt to infringe the freedom of deliberation? If it was, then we would have to reject, but it is not. Jefferson, as Secretary of State, describing how best to enforce the neutrality provisions of 1793, when England and war, England and France are at war. Vessels who do not infringe neutrality rules may lawfully engage or enlist foreign subjects. In terms of making treaties with Indians, provided no grants to individuals and no reservations to states made by the federal government would be infringed. Madison talking about relations with the former enemy, Congress should urge preempting measures to obtain from Great Britain satisfaction for the infringement of the articles aforesaid. This word infringe is central to the discussion of the Second Amendment. You know it. Second Amendment of the Constitution reads, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It's not a common term. Some of the examples I gave are some of the few times it shows up in the Founders Online, in the the searchable texts of the Founders. It's not a common word. It's a legal word used mostly in legal discussions. It usually describes an unjust, uncommon, wrong act. It also usually describes a violation or breaking of a significant power, a charter, the relations between the United States and Britain, treaties with Indian nations, the branch separation of the executive and the legislative, big important things. I was in a core debate about the word well-regulated, and that, that term is... The historic sense when it was written with you, you have to interpret it that way because it's It's written in 1787, approved, and it hasn't been amended yet. It's not regulated by the state. It's regulated good working order. So when I had that discussion, I think someone, um, I don't know whether it was pro-gun, anti-gun, or whatever, said, well, what about infringe? You know, we uh, talk about um, well-regulated, and we debate the meaning of that. And what about infringe? And I think it's not a weak word. It doesn't describe weak situations. It is not impinge. Sometimes I believe It is read as impinge that anything that borders upon 
a right, shall not be done. When used in law, you're usually using it in something that's pretty important, and that's infringement of patent and infringement of copyright. If you play copyrighted U2 music, you broke Bono's right. You made him unable to receive income from his music. Shame on you for what you've done to Bono. Also, Island Records, most importantly, also the RIAA and ASCAP, and they are pretty good at getting justice for infringers. It's also true of patents. There are patent litigation. It's a very uh, big violation of law to violate a patent. It's not a small one, and that's what we're talking about. Infringe means big violations. In the dictionary, infringe, a verb from the mid-15th century, infrangen, to violate, from the Latin, infrigere, to damage, to break off, break, bruise, fracture, break, violate, shatter to pieces, make useless, undermine. If you want to even get to the Proto-Indo-European, which is a kind of theoretical language that it's seen that a lot of the Roman, Latin, English has tenants in, the P-I-E roots of the word infringe are two parts. Now, it's going to sound weird until we explain it. N and breg. So the freg, fringe, is actually coming from the word, the P-I-E root is breg. Brabant, bracken, break, breach. Also, fractal, fracture, fragment, infraction, frail, all of these words coming from Middle English. N, as in in fringe is essentially into breaking it apart. If you inflict, you strike a blow to that person. If you increase, you grow an object within that object. Okay, so very simple. Bruce, you're not a lawyer. No, I'm not. You're using legal language. Yes, I am. Justice Antonin Scalia, Heller, in interpreting this text, we are guided by the principle that the Constitution was written to be understood by the voters its words in their normal and ordinary as distinguished from technical meaning. Something might be idiomatic, but it cannot be determined to have some secret meaning not known to most common people. So, yes, we are free to interpret words with a dictionary, essentially. We have to be a little careful about history. There's another part of the Second Amendment where there's a trick there, not the word in French. It goes back to the 15th century, understood by the framers as we understand it today. So the Constitution only uses infringe in the Second Amendment in no other place. It does use the word abridge quite often. Abridge has a very different etymology. It means to curtail, different than violate. The First Amendment language, the Fourteenth Amendment language, uses abridge. The word abridge itself is six times in the Constitution. Abridging, abridging is in the first. Margie Burns, University of Maryland, analyzes in her book the words infringe and abridge. Where infringement always meant a wrong, the more subtle concept of abridgment evolved in meaning over the centuries. Only in the 17th and 18th centuries, as human population increased, political philosophy branched out, and more attention was devoted in print to concepts of right and liberty. Did abridging come to be used as Locke, Dr. Johnson, and the U.S. founders used it? as a limit, but not a violation, in a careful distinction from infringing. It was juxtaposed with infringing an English binomial, infringed or abridged. You have to be real careful, in other words, about the first. And we know this, it's freedom of speech. Yet there are regulations that exist. You certainly can't go out and libel people and expect protection. You can't threaten people. We had a whole podcast about that. But infringement requires a much greater level for that meaning of the word, much greater level violation. And they had a choice. They're writing these amendments at the same time and had a choice. Pointedly, the creators of the first 10 amendments declined to say that the right to bear arms cannot be abridged. If they had wanted to say so, they could have. They also had access to a large warehouse of long-standing English phrases that would have put bearing arms beyond the reach of law if they had wanted to do so. But they chose to word the Second Amendment in a way that ra allows regulating. Congress is debarred only from violating, and the framers did not suggest that ordinances regulating weapons would violate anything. Such ordinances existed at the time. 
So since I'm defining in fringe and I'm giving um, the professor from the University of Maryland her take on it, I also wanted to give you a sense of how the NRA, most prominent of the gun rights organizations, would define this word and define this. Here, here's what it says on the NRA website. Though times have changed dramatically, the need for defenses afforded by the Second Amendment has remained the same. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The final line states that citizens have the individual right to own firearms for lawful purposes, and that the government may not interfere with that right. So, again, if we take the NRA at their words, infringe is interference. They further state the Fourth Amendment, which protects other fundamental in the Fourth Amendment, which protects another fundamental individual right, uses similar language. The Fourth Amendment states the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. This similarity, the NRA says, is notable because it affirms that the Founding Fathers intended the Second Amendment to protect an individual right. District of Columbia v. Heller, a landmark Supreme Court case for the Second Amendment, references this comparison. Okay, so there's two things I want to point out there. One, in the NRA's argument, having stated it, that um, the Fourth Amendment uses the word violated and not infringed. It is a synonym, but a more um, definite and one without other connotations. Where in fringe is used elsewhere, again, we have that kind of great or sovereign power, often a treaty or law being infringed. I don't want to dwell on that too much. It could be argued against what I just said that, look... <laughs> There's a limited amount of words you can use, and, and, and legal folks employ a variety of vocabulary to make things sound interesting. You certainly have some, like, phrases in law that sound interesting. So you re could be reading too much into infringe, first abridge, first violated. Okay, okay, that's possible. Um, I do think the, the Ten Amendments were considered at the same time. Uh, they had the same principal author, Madison, although he was working closely with the House and the Senate. He was borrowing from various statements um, in state constitutions. Here's what would have been in his own home state of Virginia in the Declaration of Rights since 1776. Article 10. The general warrants whereby any officer or messenger may be commanded to search suspected places without evidence of a fact committed or to seize any person or persons not named, or whose offense is not particularly described and supported by evidence, are grievous and oppressive, and ought not to be granted. But here's the issue. I don't think you want to hang your hat on the Fourth Amendment, because while it's an example of a strong constitutional right, it has a lot of limits, a lot more than the first. It's really limited to your house. Um numerous court cases about seizure of, say, cars and things like that. So if you're hanging your head on that, you're not speaking well to, say, carry laws, in my opinion. I, you know, I know there's a case before the Supreme Court right now on that. If you're hanging your head on the fourth, my point would be you're already then you're then accepting a precedent with where of a right with a lot of limits. OK, so why am I even infringing your time talking about this, right? Because I think it's so important that if it's that high of a threshold, it speaks a lot to today's issues. I do not think background checks, for instance, infringe upon the Second Amendment. I do not think that rules about someone's mental condition and owning a firearm infringe upon the Second Amendment. I do not think that rules about someone being a felon infringe upon the Second Amendment. And oh, by the way, it doesn't appear, neither do most justices, and neither does anything stated in the Heller decision of 2008. This very important and often ignored part of the Heller decision, like most rights, the Second Amendment right is not unlimited. It is not a right to keep and carry any weapon whatsoever, 
in any manner whatsoever, and for whatever purpose. The court's opinion should not be taken to cast doubt on long-standing prohibitions on the possession of firearms by felons and the mentally ill, or laws forbidding the carrying of firearms in sensitive places such as schools and government buildings, or laws imposing conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of arms. There's no serious constitutional case being made for any of those issues. You do have a current live debate going on about concealed carry, and we'll get into that. There's a New York case that's before the Supreme Court, probably be decided in a couple of days or a couple of weeks. But I see a big contrast between some of the internet debates, some of the rhetoric things about, you're going to take my guns away, or you can't touch guns at all. You can't even give me a day's delay to getting a firearm. You can't say anything about firearms. You can't regulate any type of weapon. That's not the current law. And that isn't consistent with with the word infringe. The history of words is not that important to politics. I don't talk about words and linguistics a lot, unless politics and law mixes with words and makes words the deciding matter. And so it is with a lot of the Second Amendment debates. The recent discussion over the Second Amendment in the wake of horrible myriad school shootings is an important discussion, but some of it's misguided. Most proposals that are made, in my opinion, have nothing to do with the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment does not block them. Most of the proposals do not require repeal of the Second Amendment. I don't believe it requires a significant reinterpretation. I believe there's enough there. We'll get into some of the recent court activities on that. With any history of the Bill of Rights, we have to consider what it is. Constitutional Convention, 1787, agree on a draft for a constitution. It's sent out to the states for ratification. That convention in Philadelphia You know, you have to say it was the great minds, but it was also the elites. I mean, there were great people. Washington was leading that convention. Roger Sherman, George Wythe, who had been one of the prominent legal scholars in Virginia. Benjamin Franklin's there. You know, Jefferson and Adams are not present. They are abroad. But a lot of the legal minds in the states are there. And they finished that convention. And this is an important thing to remember. Washington and Franklin are there, and they, including James Madison, leave that convention without any Bill of Rights at all, including no Second Amendment. That's something to think about when you're going to start talking about founders and framers and what they're saying. There's a big group of them that had no particular need for a second. Mason, you could say George Mason did want a Bill of Rights, and he probably wanted something close to Virginia because Virginia had a clause that read this, that a well-regulated militia comprised of the body of the people trained to arms is the proper, natural, and safe defense of a free state, that standing armies in time of peace should be avoided as dangerous to liberty, and that in all cases the military should be under strict subordination to and governed by the civil power. Section 13 of the Virginia Bill of Rights. Now, you know, the first thing you're going to say, there's nothing in there about keep and bearing arms. That's right. Massachusetts at the same time, though, the people have a right to keep and bear arms for the common defense. And as in time of peace, armies are dangerous to liberty. They ought not to be maintained without the consent of the legislature. And the military power shall always be held in exact subordination to the civil authority and be governed by it. Do we notice something in this trend? What's the real issue at work here? It's avoiding standing armies. It's protecting the country, no doubt, protecting the people, but it's also avoiding a national army. Here's Rhode Island, number 17, that the people have a right to keep and bear arms, that a well-regulated militia, including the body of the people capable of bearing arms, is the proper, natural, and safe defense of a free state. That the military shall not be subject to martial law except in time of war, rebellion, or insurrection that standing armies in the time of peace are dangerous to liberty and ought not to be kept up. They're all mentioning this in the State Bill of Rights. Patrick Henry, uh, who we're going to mention on this podcast for the July 4th, he's going to be our feature for July 4th, is a big proponent. That's what is carried over into what James Madison writes as the Second Amendment. So that's the impetus for the Second Amendment, is a defense for the country, the militia, 
and a defense against some kind of national standing army, which we have. We have a United States Army now, but that's what our democracy long ago decided, and we changed. But back then, we were fearful of standing armies. And it wasn't just Pennsylvania or Quakers or something like that. It was many states. It's way too far to simply read it out of the Constitution and say there's nothing there about arms at all. We can just ignore that. That's an old, antiquated thing. People with wigs, no reason to even bother with that. No, it's in there, and it's pretty clear, and you can't read it out. And why does it matter in 2022? Because it was never repealed. But I do think you have to understand it in the context of its time. The militia was not just the National Guard, as it is constituted today, or something under the governor's control, but it also had elements of democracy and people were elected. But here's the thing. It had elements of control, well-regulated. It didn't show up to that militia unless you were a responsible adult who could handle a weapon. Just simple limits on who would be in the militia, who could muster, were common in all of the states. You also can't say, in my belief, that it's completely collective. In other words, that it's only there for, say, the state National Guard. Keep and bear. They don't want those arms locked away in a, you know, in some government-controlled warehouse. Okay, so you, you get all that. Yeah, it's too narrow a definition to say only for state National Guards or something like that. It's the militia. But was the militia at this time... It was understood as all people are actually at that time all able bodied men. Very important that able bodied. Okay. That's the understanding of the militia. You can make arguments about it being limited to muskets or being limited to an official militia, but the militia at that time was uh, organized, but also had unofficial elements. You know, it was a militia of the people in an area to protect themselves. And yes, there's constitutional language that they can be commanded by the President of the United States if necessary as a way to avoid a standing army. That's what was decided. So, you know, when you look at it from that example of what we're actually talking about in the second, I think it informs it greatly. What about something like concealed carry? I think it goes to a political debate. And I think you lose some of the constitutional king of the hill when the argument goes from home to keep to being able to bear anywhere. You know, bear really means during a military event. So you can just carry it everywhere. I think you're getting to a little bit more of the area where it might be a privilege extended by the state. It's debatable. I do, on that point, I'm going to like kind of take my history hat off and say that's my personal opinion of it. And there's a court case coming up, and I suspect that the Supreme Court will probably go 6-3 against it. And it's the uh, against the law that's currently in New York shall issue or may issue mechanism. Put that aside for a bit. When it comes to the issue of some of the shootings that have occurred, we're not generally talking about concealed. I mean, it is an issue, I'm sure, for some. We're generally talking about background checks, who carries, who can exercise what may you know, be a constituted right, who gets to exercise it. Does society have any role? And there are some who are going to be all the way on the natural rights side that will say no. By the way, on natural rights, here's an interesting one from the New Hampshire 1784. New Hampshire does not have a right to bear arms in this constitution. It did add it in in, in 1982. But in 1780, Article 3, when men enter into a state of society, they surrender up some of their natural rights to that society in order to ensure the protection of others. And without such an equivalent, the surrender is void. Right? So you get it. There is one reason to give up rights, according to New Hampshire, in the understanding of people even before the Constitution was signed. And that is to protect others. We live in a society. You can say anything you want about the framers, and we can debate, but there's one thing I just cannot agree with, and that's that the framers were a kind of stoic people, that if there was some kind of right in the way, they would not solve a problem that was pressing. And there's no evidence in American history of that. These people, these Jeffersons, these Franklins, these Washingtons, these Madisons, um, were thoroughly engaged in the solving of problems of their time. If they didn't address something, it wasn't a significant problem of their time. If you 
enjoy bizarre true stories, then the Useless Information Podcast is the podcast for you. For example, did you know that author Robert Louis Stevenson gave his birthday away? Or that there was a football team that played for six years before someone realized that the school never, ever existed? Or that a dog in upstate New York was once placed on trial for murder? Well, to hear these and hundreds of additional fascinating true stories from the flip side history, be sure to check out the Useless Information Podcast. That's the Useless Information Podcast, podcasting worldwide since 2008 and available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. Be sure to check it out. Napoleon Bonaparte rose from obscurity to become the most powerful and significant figure in modern history. Over 200 years after his death, people are still debating his legacy. He was a man of contradictions, a tyrant and a reformer, a liberator and an oppressor, a revolutionary and a reactionary. His biography reads like a novel, and his influence is almost beyond measure. I'm Everett Rummage, host of the Age of Napoleon podcast, and every month I delve into the turbulent life and times of one of the greatest characters in history, and explore the world that shaped him in all its glory and tragedy. It's a story of great battles and campaigns, political intrigue, and massive social and economic change, but it's also a story about people populated with remarkable characters. I hope you'll join me as I examine this fascinating era of history. Find The Age of Napoleon wherever you get your podcasts. June 17th, 1933, Kansas City train station. Frank Nash is a, a federal prisoner. And with the help of the FBI, they were able to suss out that he was hiding in Hot Springs, Arkansas. And FBI agents, with the knowledge, quietly picked him up and then put him on a train, along with those agents guarding him. Word got out. And associates of this criminal, whose criminal record reached back to 20 years before, he had just escaped from, a, from Leavenworth Prison. He had powerful friends, bank robbers, well-funded, who had participated in robberies throughout the Midwest. This was the era of Dillinger, of Pretty Boy Floyd, of the FBI, uh, F the FBI and even local police being confounded by a series of crimes where the criminals outgunned them. The law officers were on a Missouri Pacific train bound for Kansas City, due to arrive at 7.15 a.m. on June 17, 1933. They made arrangements for the FBI's Kansas City office FBI agent to meet them up. Well, word got out, and train schedules are public information. The agents and local police officers go from the train through the station outside without an incident. Chief Reed, Special Agent Charge Vetterly, FBI agents Caffrey and Smith, armed with either shotguns or pistols, pause briefly, don't see anything that arouses their suspicion, and proceed to a Chevrolet. The criminal is handcuffed. The Chevrolet is parked directly in front of Union Station, Kansas City. They unlock the right door. As it's opened, Nash starts to get into the back seat. One agent tells Nash, get into the front of the car. The FBI agents want to be behind him in case he tries anything. Moments later, Agent Caffrey notices something. There's two men running from behind a car. Both of them are armed. At least one of them have a machine gun. One of the gunmen shouts, up, up, and then let him have it. Two police officers are killed immediately. FBI agent Vetterly is shot in the left arm. Agent Caffrey fa uh, falls, wounded to the head. There's tremendous level of fire. The prisoner that they're trying to rescue, Frank Nash, is riddled with bullets and killed. The gunmen actually walk over to the car. They look in. They see everybody's dead. They said, they're all dead. Let's get out of here. There's no one to rescue. Cop comes out of the train station, begins firing all for naught. They speed out of a car and disappear. The only ones who are able to, to, to survive this is agents, two FBI agents, Lackey and Smith, falling forward in the back seat of the Chevrolet. They have two technologies that are putting them ahead of the police, and that is fast automobiles and rapid-fire machine guns. 
The result of this and other incidents is that, and at the same time, a new administration, Franklin Roosevelt, Democratic House and Senate, Senator Copeland, a Democrat from New York, says, we can never be free from the menace of promiscuous killings until the possession of firearms is everywhere restricted to persons of known character. So to be fair, Copeland's not even talking about just getting rid of all guns. He passes the National Firearms Act. It has a unique scheme on certain weapons, sawed-off shotguns of a certain length, machine guns. They don't ban them. They impose a tax of $200. It's pretty easy. The, the tax is $3,500 in, in today's dollars. Strictly, you know, um, cost of living increase, okay? Inflation. You get into like a working man's wage standard of measuring money over time. It's probably about a $10,000 fee. That couldn't matter less. Uh, criminals aren't going to pay a tax. They're not going to be on record with the IRS paying a tax. Uh, with the Treasury Department, I don't know if IRS would handle it. It'd probably be ATF that would, um, they're not going to get on record paying a tax. If someone wants to have one and they can afford it and they're not a criminal, they can pay that fee if they had that level of money. It's such a nifty idea that even the National Rifle Association at the time agrees with the legislation. It's tested in the case of United States versus Miller. Miller has an illegal sawed-off shotgun. He does not show up for his court case. He flees. But nonetheless, because of the issue of ownership of guns and the tax issue, it goes before the Supreme Court. The court decides to uphold the law. And the key thing that it says about the Second Amendment in U.S. v. Miller is that it's not the type of weapon that an ordinary person would have. They used the term at the time state militia. This has led to a lot of modern jurisprudence, including a case I just heard before the Supreme Court about New York's carry law, just writing it off, writing Miller off. But that's not what D.C. versus Heller does. D.C. versus Heller upholds Miller, does not overturn it at least, and believes in that decision that they are continuing the precedent of, of an unusual weapon being, say, okay to tax or ban, but not a normal one that is in everyday use. A short-barreled shotgun was modified by a criminal quite often and had been noted by law enforcement as the type of weapon that, um, you know, could be regulated. They wanted regulated. I do think this gun debate that we're having now becomes very different when you look at the 1920s, but I'm going to kind of say that that ship has sailed a little bit, except to say that, again, Heller didn't overrule Miller. Maybe um, New York versus Brune will, but or some other law will, but until then, it is the precedent and the law of the land, U.S. v. Miller. You're still allowed to ban weapons that are of an unusual nature. I mean, here's the thing. Anything around the Second Amendment guns, anything like that, are difficult issues for our politics because on both sides, they do not want to be engaging with the other. They don't want to live in the world where any part of the other's ideas succeed. That's really what it is. On one side, you have natural law. I have a natural law right to own firearms. It cannot be taken away even the Second Amendment is just a piece of paper that, you know, saves some time. But my right didn't come from that. You know, those type of bedrock attitudes also combined with my horror is that I am disarmed. And then we have a situation where there's a erosion of rights. We have a government that doesn't represent me. And now we lose everything. And you have extremes on that, meaning some might think that would happen the next day from when guns are lost, and others might believe it's a more gradual thing, but still would happen. Okay. At the same time, huge group cannot even understand why people own guns at all, or certainly want access to some of the type of uh, guns that are available. They're not talking to each other. In my estimation, I don't think this thing is going to result in some kind of grand conference where 
both sides talk to each other and resolve it. I actually think it's going to be a moving past type issue. What do I mean by that? Gun rights get some of the things it wants. Gun control gets some of the things it wants. Never the twain actually meeting. You know, decisions get overruled. Decisions get made. Decisions get overruled over time. Because if it were to be something where you had the kind of grand conference of everyone talking, looking at words like well-regulated and infringe, as I had done, um, I don't want to make guesses, but I believe it would come down to something like, if you're on the left side of things, you've got to think about what part of your position fits better into a early American historical situation. That's why I bring up the the actual militia, which was a real thing, the militia in the various states to be combined and ordered by the president. Washington used the militia in one case in the Whiskey Rebellion in the 1790s, so it's actually been done. It was very useful to Jefferson um, in the 1807 conflict with Great Britain. Well, you had British ships actually treating Americans badly, right? Not, not on the high ocean, right there in the Chesapeake. Okay, militia were an important part of uh, making sure that uh, landings were prevented and things like that. Then the War of eighteen twelve, real thing. How do you fit it into that? And I think the only possible communication is um, across things like training or who is qualified, because individuals. Um, right, I believe they have a right, but might be persuaded that they're, they're by their definition, not collective thinkers. So they might be persuaded that, um, someone else is crazier than I, and we could do steps to prevent that person from having, uh, access to weapons. And that would be the way to chip away at that issue. But that's in a dialogue that really isn't occurring. This isn't what's occurring. This is kind of like a moving past and both appealing to the basis type issue. Um, on the other hand, uh, for the gun rights group, again, that you, there's no, no limited dialogue in terms of trying to meet in the middle on something because they think anything's really just a fig leaf to taking away guns. I mean, that's the way I see it. But I would encourage them to separate what is an actual right from what is a legislature deciding to have a more liberal gun law and to I just, you know, if they're even willing to have a dialogue, uh, I would encourage them to think about how much, right? Maybe stop thinking of the second as the first. Because with the first, we're kind of like, how much speech? There are limits, by the way. I can't just start operating a TV station or radio station. So my speech in a, in a mechanized form is regulated quite a bit. But yes, we obviously have a fair amount of... Uh, free speech. I would encourage them to think about the second in in a different way and to think about how much of this right do we reasonably need. Is everyone who is in support of gun rights on the side of those who think it's there to protect against tyranny? Is that really the whole group Uh, or is that a limited group? What limits would be accepted? What um, what laws would be accepted? Is any law just unacceptable? These are all things to think about. Again, that's that's in my head. If there was a dialogue actually occurring, I don't think out there it is. I really don't. Not not on the internet that I see. I'm not saying there aren't a few reasonable people and all of that, but I just don't think the discourse um, is actually there. It's not really occurring. So that's it. It's it's two people just being amazed by the other's arguments if they're even talking. That's it. It should be remembered that what DC was doing in the Heller case, Heller's a security guard, wanted to bring his gun home, handgun. It had an absolute handgun ban in the city. The handgun and the trigger lock requirement as applied to self-defense violate the Second Amendment. Scalia writes in his decision, four others agree, the district's total ban on handgun possession in the home amounts to a prohibition on an entire class of arms that Americans overwhelmingly chose for the lawful purpose of self-defense. In the Heller decision, Scalia leaves on the table concealed background checks, assault weapons, bans. Um, he, 
in in subsequent interviews talks about we're really only talking about handheld arms here. So when you get into like rocket launchers and cannons and tanks and things like that, he's not even applying a second to it. We also want to be a little careful between what Scalia might have written in a decision in 2008 and what he might have wanted to do. Remember, Kennedy and Roberts were on that court and he needed them. He had shown a proclivity to want to hear other cases. For instance, there's a case in California where a town had banned assault weapons. And he actually wanted to hear that case and made it very clear he wanted to hear. Let's talk about, though, what's going to go on probably in a few days or a few weeks. It is possible that uh, the concealed carry laws of New York, one of a few states that still have a restrictive rule on concealed carries that you must uh, in New York State, in order to get a concealed carry permit to carry a firearm, you must submit to the New York authorities the reason you need it. And if it's for self-defense, there must be a specific threat that you are afraid of. It cannot be some general fear, at least according to the New York State rules, it cannot be that you merely live in a high crime area. It would have to be some specific uh, threat to you. Um, an example might be uh, one case that was granted. The the pe- petitioner said that, I hey, there's sometimes at night that I have to go and it's a dark parking lot. Well, the New York state authorities granted him a right at that time, but not a permit for any time he wanted to carry. The court seemed very skeptical and listening to the oral arguments. I don't always want to take their oral arguments at their word, but the questions that Alito, Thomas, Barrett, even Roberts, you know, they, they questioned severely New York State and seemed to agree more with the petitioner. The only limits that I think that they're going to accept is some area where, like a football stadium, an office building, a university, a school. Um, so I think that there's, in my opinion, you know, and this is really mine, um, it's kind of like, well, you decided in Heller that the second has a right, but you had to use some inference to get that right out of it. But Heller never decided on concealed carry issues. And in fact, said that it said directly that concealed carry could be considered legal according to the and traditional. So that's, you know, personal opinion, but it looks like the court's going possibly even 6-3 to make it so you have a shall issue, which is going to be pretty much background check, issue the permit. In doing so, I believe they're going far, they're certainly going farther than the Heller decision did, farther than the McDonald decision did. They would be, yeah, entering an expansion of a right. Some people may celebrate that. I think in the wake of an uncontrollable situation with uh, school shootings and public place shootings, I don't know that everyone will agree with that. Um, I also think it's more subject to reversal the more that it's expanded. Um, one of the the two things that I don't like in the court's reasoning, just listening to oral arguments, is that one, that kind of stretch, like, okay, we established this right in Heller. It's not a right written. It's kind of a right seen. But we do that other times. I mean, certainly Roe v. Wade is a right of privacy scene. Griswold, a right of privacy scene, not enumerated. If you're going to now extend it to concealed, so you're kind of building on something that's already questionable, making a second legal decision and asserting a constitutional right. The argument might be, well, this is exactly what was done with law and order, with freedom of speech in the 60s and 70s, so, um, you know, fair game kind of thing. Okay, probably subject to reversal if court changes, and it might be 20 years from now. Again, I go to... When I look at the framers, I don't see them as people who shied away from a problem, decided not to solve it. They didn't have this particular problem that we have of these mass shootings at public places. They had other disturbances, certainly. And um, as has been argued in the New York case, there were some laws. Tennessee had a law banning pistols in 1821. Texas had a similar law. What the court has done, and this is another thing that I don't agree with, is sort of used history to go way back, but to ignore, say, the 20s 
as history. But that's a hundred years now. It's a very important part of our history. One of the amicus briefs in the in the recent New York case, a group of professors that were on neither side, they merely said, and there's a professor from Duke, professor from NYU, a group of uh, law professors, just handle it the way the appeals courts are handling these cases now. Does this regulation that this town have or this locality has, does it violate the Second Amendment? What was decisive in Heller was not the district's inability to point to a history of all jurisdictions at all times, having adopted a law like its own, but rather that the district's law left no room for the exercise of a right that virtually all legal sources in history had recognized. As such, under Heller, the touchstone of a Second Amendment violation that transcends means and scrutiny is an unbroken tradition of recognizing a right to use weapons in a way that the law forbids. The lack of an unbroken tradition of laws like the one being challenged does not establish a Second Amendment violation. The Second Amendment permits the people to prohibit what they have sometimes permitted. It does not place every use of weapons the founders or others have made at some times and in some places categorically beyond the police power at all times in all places. The framework used by courts of appeals protects the people's fundamental right to keep and bear arms while ensuring that people can protect themselves through legislation. The court should use that framework. This is the Seventh Circuit decision, Ezelver City of Chicago. A law does not burden Second Amendment rights if it either falls within one of the presumptually lawful regulatory measures identified in Heller, what the appeals courts have basically said is, leave it at Heller. Don't go farther. There's a right there. It's not unlimited, like Heller says. We in the rest of the courts can determine what is an unreasonable burden, an infringement on that right. I can't answer all these questions. That's why, you know, mostly I wanted to narrowly focus on that infringe word. But of course, we're going to get into the issue a little bit. And we did. The website's www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. I want to thank you for listening.